You've seen the flood of upcoming fighting games and decided this is your time to shine and get in on the ground floor. Maybe now is also the time to invest in that fight stick you always wanted. Sure, you could always buy stock, but you could also build your own crazy custom unique to you. How does one assemble a fight stick? Let me assure you that they are probably simpler than you imagine, and in this video, I'll walk you through some of the parts you'll need and show you how they all come together. Let's get started. A fight stick first requires an enclosure. These are usually made of wood, acrylic, or metal, to varying degrees of size, weight, and complexity, but most are around 12 to 18 inches in length if you're looking to fabricate your own. After that, you'll need buttons, typically six or eight 30 millimeter ones for the face, and then a small handful for the aux functions. You can't have a true fight stick without the actual joystick, so you'll also need one of those. Following that, you'll need a PCB or printed circuit board to act as the brains of the fight stick, which can also balloon in price depending on which systems will require compatibility. Then you'll need a wiring harness to connect everything, a new trick or comparable connection port, and a USB hookup to link it all to a console or PC. All button builds like a branded hitbox controller require all the same parts minus the joystick, but they'll need an additional four face buttons to take its place. Here are all the parts I'll be using, and I'll talk more about each one as I assemble. But before I begin this build, I wanted to speak briefly about the Rainbow Goblin theme. If you don't care to hear that, feel free to skip ahead to the time shown here to see the fight stick begin to take shape. This particular build is for a friend, and he's a big fan of all things music, and he suggested designing a stick based around the Desaturating 7 Primus album and the colorful illustrations from the Rainbow Goblin's children's book on which it drew its inspiration. For the uninitiated, this whimsical and fun children's book follows seven scheming goblins as they try to lasso and drink the colors from sentient rainbows before their greed eventually blinds their ambitions and they are unceremoniously trapped and drowned in a sea of colors by a meadow of flowers. Yeah. Anyway, I knew it needed to be weird and wonderful, and when I saw this 15 by 9 Butterbanger version 1 enclosure from Buttercade, the one-off top panel of melting colors really spoke to me and seemed very much in line with both the album and the book. The oozing, dripping colors were great, but I can admit that I was initially just a little bit discouraged that I wouldn't be allowed to add any art without covering it. But the goblins are such an integral part of the theme that I felt I must have them included somewhere. So I snagged a suitable image from the net, trimmed and heavily saturated it in Photoshop, then printed it on a piece of high quality adhesive vinyl. I've never done this before, so we shall see how well it holds up with intermittent play. I stuck to the face panel and trimmed the overhang with a hobby knife. I tried to avoid black in this build where I could since that kind of seems like the opposite of a rainbow goblin. For the bottom, I could have gone with black or green foam padding, but I had to go with a more colorful option to help push that theme. So, now we have our enclosure and a clear path forward. For the lever, I chose to install a Sanwa JLF with the Auto DIY V5 kit. This is a great kit and it really elevates a standard JLF in my opinion. I've used them in previous builds, it feels great, and it's very efficient in terms of price and quality. The Teflon parts reduce friction for buttery smooth stick travel and enable a less frequent need for maintenance and lubrication. I also use the 13mm actuator for a tighter throw to shorten the distance between the actuator and the plunger and speed up actuation. I equipped this one with a rounded square gate because it's my current favorite gate option. For the buttons, I wanted to bring back to mind the names and colors of the goblins, so I used clear rimmed Sanwa snap-ins and oriented them with their neighboring colors as they would actually appear. This was a less typical and perhaps more ergonomic button layout called Sao Labi. It had the usual eight button holes, but we only have seven goblins. After a bit of digging, I found that there is a ludicrously priced sequel to the original book called The White Goblin, so it seemed only right that it should also make an appearance here to round out our total. I chose clear rimmed buttons because I want to come back later with some LEDs to really make those colors pop. More on that in a bit. For the brains of the stick, I chose to use a wireless brook board to net access to PS3, PS4, Switch, and PC. I've never before used this board in any of my sticks, but I wanted to give one a shot, and this definitely seemed like a good opportunity to try one out. 
I also grabbed a buttercade antenna socket and the buttercade board and battery mount to make it easier to affix the PCB inside the case. Once I got everything where I wanted it, I hooked up a wiring harness to link the buttons, stick, and PCB. The 5-pin connection makes it easy to connect to a joystick. Note that if you're using a Samitsu joystick over a Sanwa, that you will need to flip the connector because that brand orients the ground on the opposite side. Now, because there are no transparent windows to show it off and this one will never be seen inside a fully enclosed build, I chose to use a standard non-sleeved option for my wiring harness. To be clear, a button is just a button. There's no such thing as a light punch button and a heavy kick button out of the box. It's all about how they are wired. A good thing about this wiring harness is that the wiring colors correspond to a button function so you can easily get a standard layout. I couldn't forget about the aux buttons and wired up these side button options for the options, PS, and share. You will need a minimum of three aux buttons, but if you'd like more training room options and such, you can get mileage out of up to six. This extra bit here is a recess bit used to help protect the antenna for the wireless functionality. The theme is so colorful it only felt right to introduce some lights. Kaimanas are great, but can be expensive for the lighting option, so I used a cheaper alternative I first learned from Johnny Fraze. Go check out his content if you haven't. For $10 or less, I can just buy an LED strip and then cut the cord in about halfway to the USB connection, removing it. From there, I remove the sleeving to expose the bare wires and then hook the black ground here and the red power here. Then I just unspool as much of the strip as I need, cut at an appropriate dissection point, which are always clearly marked, and call it good. I was initially worried about the wireless board trying to power the LEDs from the battery, but that isn't the case. Nothing else is powered when hooked up via battery, and the lights only work when you physically link it with a cord to the console or PC. If you wanted a true wireless LED, for some reason, then you will need to grab power from the analog pins here. Now that we're almost done, let's leave him a note in case he ever opens this bad boy up for maintenance or to change out some parts. There. Hilarious. Once everything was all together, I updated the firmware and the brick board, and then we had ourselves a playable stick. Hooked up to the PC, the LEDs look awesome, and the white sides look great pumping colors as well. Time to put on some Primus and head to the battle lounge. Anyway, I hope this helps you understand a bit of the process and gives you the confidence to build your own. Support your locals, and I'll see you next time.